Chapter Sixteen of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter Sixteen out of the day and night a joy has taken flight life i know not what thou art you too cries miss maliphant pleasantly in her loud good-natured voice she addresses them as though it has been borne in upon her by constant reminding that joyce and dysart are for the best of all reasons generally to be found together there is something not only genial but sympathetic in her tones something that embarrasses dysart and angers joyce to the last degree well i'm glad to have met you for one moment out of the early burly goes on the massive heiress to joyce with the friendliest of smiles i'm off at cock-crow you know and so mightn't have had the opportunity of saying good-bye to you but for this fortunate meeting to-morrow says joyce more with the matter of one who feels she must say something than from any desire to say it yes and so early that i shall not have in my power to bid farewell to any one unless indeed with a glance at beauclerk meant perhaps to be coquettish but so elephantine in its proportions as to be almost anything in the world but that some of my friends may wish to see the sun rise we shall miss you says joyce gracefully though with an effort just what i've been saying breaks in beauclerk at this juncture who hitherto has been looking on with an altogether delightful smile upon his handsome face we shall all miss miss maliphant it is not often that one meets with an entirely genial companion my sister is to be congratulated on securing such an acquisition if only for a short time joyce lifting her eyes stares straight at him for a short time what does that mean if miss maliphant is to be lady baltimore's sister-in-law she will undoubtedly secure her for a lifetime oh you are too good said miss maliphant giving him a playful flick with her fan well what would you have me say persists beauclerk still lightly with wonderful lightness in fact considering the weight of that playful tap upon his bent knuckles that we shall not be sorry would you have me lie then fee fee miss maliphant the truth the truth and nothing but the truth at all risks and hazards here he almost imperceptibly sends flying a shaft from his eyes at joyce who receives it with a blank stare we shall i assure you be desolated when you go specially isabel this last pretty little speech strikes dysart as being specially neat this putting the onus of the regret on isabel's shoulders all through beauclerk has been careful to express himself as one who is an appreciative friend of miss maliphant but nothing more yet so guarded are these expressions and the looks that accompany them that miss maliphant might be pardoned if she should read a warmer feeling in them a sensation of disgust darkens his brow i must say you are all very nice to me says the heiress complacently poor soul no doubt 
she believes in every bit of it and a large course of cow towing from the world has taught her the value of her pile however with true manchester grace there is no need for howling over it we'll all meet again i dare say some time or another for one thing lady baltimore has asked me to come here again after christmas february i dare say so glad murmurs joyce rather vaguely so you see says miss maliphant with ponderous gaiety that we are all bound to put in a second good time together you're coming i know mr dysart and miss kavanagh is always here and mr beauclerk with a languishing glance at the charming person who returns it in the most open manner has promised me that he will be here to meet me well if i can you know says he now beaming at her how's that says the heiress turning promptly upon him it is strange how undesirable the very rich heiress can be at times why it's only just this instant that you told me nothing would keep you away from court next spring what do you mean she brings him to book in a most uncompromising fashion a fashion that betrays unmistakably her plebeian origin dysart listening admires her for it her rough and ready honesty seems to him preferable to the best bred shuffling in the world did i say all that says beauclerk lightly coloring a little nevertheless as he marks the fine smile that is curling joyce's lips why then gaily if i said it i mean it if i hesitated about endorsing my intentions publicly it is because one is never sure of happiness beforehand believe me miss maliphant with a little bow to her but with a direct glance at joyce every desire i have is centred in the hope the next spring may see me here again well i expect we have the same wish says miss maliphant cheerfully who has not caught that swift glance at joyce i am sure i hope that nothing will interfere with my coming here in february it is agreed then says beauclerk with a delightfully comprehensive smile that seems to take in every one even the plants and the dripping fountain and the little marble god in the corner who is evidently listening with all his might we all meet here again early next year if the fates be propitious you dysart you pledge yourself to join our circle then i pledge myself says dysart fixing a cold gaze on him it is so cold so distinctively hostile that beauclerk grows uncomfortable beneath it when uncomfortable his natural bias leads him towards a display of bonhomie here we have before us a prospect to cheer the soul of any man declares he shifting his eyes from dysart to miss maliphant it cheers me certainly responds the heavy maiden with alacrity i like to think we shall all meet again like the witches in macbeth says joyce indifferently but not so malignantly i hope says the heiress brilliantly who like most worthy people can never see beyond her own nose for my part i like old friends much better than new she looks round for the appreciation that should attend this sound remark and is gratified to find dysart is smiling at her perhaps the core of that smile might not have been altogether to her taste most cores are difficult of digestion to her to whom all things are new where does the flavor of the old come in beauclerk is looking at joyce 
"I hope the prospect cheers you, too," says he, a little sharply, as if nettled by her determined silence and bent on making her declare herself. "You, I trust, will be here next February?" "Sure to be," says she with an enigmatic smile. "Not a jot or tittle of your enjoyments will be lost to you in the coming year. Both your friends, Miss Maliphant and I, will be here to welcome you when you return." Something in her manner, in the half defiant light in her eyes, puzzles Beauclerk. What has happened to her since they were last together? Not more than an hour ago, she seemed, er, well. Inwardly, he smiles complacently. But now, could she? Is it possible? Was there a chance that... Miss Kavanagh, begins he, moving towards her. But she makes short work of his advance. I repent, says she, turning a lovely smiling face on Dysart. A while ago I said I was too tired to dance. I did myself injustice. That waltz. Listen to it. Lifting up an eager finger, would it not wake an anchorite from his aesthetic dreams? Come, there is time. She has sprung to her feet. Life is in every movement. She slips her arm into Dysart's. Not understanding, yet half understanding, moves with her, his heart on fire for her, his puzzlement rendering him miserable. Beauclerk, with that doubt of what she really knows full upon him, is wiser. Without hesitation, he offers his arm to Miss Maliphant, and so swift is his desire to quit the scene he passes dysart and joyce the latter having paused for a moment to recover her fan you see says beauclerk bending over the iris when a turn in the conservatory has hidden him from the view of those behind i told you he says nothing more it is the veriest whisper spoken with an assumption of merriment very well achieved yet if she would have looked at him she could have seen that his very lips are white but as i have said miss maliphant's mind has not been trained to the higher courses yes one can see laughs she happily and it is charming isn't it to find two people thoroughly in love with each other now a days is to believe in that mad old world of romance of which we read they're very nice too both of them i do like joyce she's one in a thousand and mr dysart is just suited to her they are both thorough there's no nonsense about them now that you have pointed it out to me i think i never saw two people so much in love with each other as they providentially she is looking away from him to where a quadrille is forming in the ballroom so that the deadly look of hatred that adorns his handsome face is unknown to her Meantime, Joyce, with the convenient fan recovered, is looking with sad eyes at Dysart. Come, the music will soon cease, says she. Why do you speak to me like that? cries he vehemently. If you don't want to dance, why not say so to me? Why not trust me? Good heavens, if I were your bitterest enemy, you could not treat me more distantly and yet i would die to make you happy don't says she in a little choking sort of way turning her face from him she struggles with herself for a moment and then still with her face averted says meekly thank you then if you don't mind 
I should rather not dance any more to-night. Why didn't you say that at first? says he, with a last remnant of reproach. No, there shall be no more dancing to-night for either you or me. A word, Joyce, turning eagerly toward her, you won't forget your promise about that walk to-morrow no no indeed thank you they are sitting very close together and almost insensibly his hand seeks and finds hers it was lying idle on her lap and lifting it he would have raised it to his lips but with a sharp violent action she wrests it from him and as a child might hides it behind her if you would have me believe in you no no not that says she a little incoherently her voice rendering her meaning with difficulty dysart astonished stands back from her waiting for something more but nothing comes except two large tears that steal heavily painfully down her cheeks she brushes them impatiently away forgive me she says somewhat brokenly to you who are so good to me i am unkind while to those who are unkind to me i she is trying to rally it was a mere whim believe me i have always hated demonstrations of any sort and why should you want to kiss my hand i shouldn't says he if his eyes have fallen from her eyes to her lips never mind says she i didn't understand perhaps but why can't you be content with things as they are are you content with them i think so i have been examining myself and honestly i think so says she a little feverishly well i am not returns he with decision you must give me credit for a great private store of amiability if you imagine that i am satisfied to take things as they now exist between you and me you have your faults you see as well as another says she with a frown you are persistent and the worst of it is that you are generally right she frowns again but even while frowning glances sideways from under her long lashes with an expression hardly uncivil that is the worst crime in the calendar be wrong sometimes and you love me it will gain you a world of friends if it could gain me your love in return i might risk it says he boldly but that is hopeless i'm afraid shaking his head i am too often in the wrong not to know that neither my many frailties nor my few virtues can ever purchase for me the only good thing on which my soul is set i have told you of one fault now hear another says she capriciously you are too earnest what turning upon him passionately as if a little ashamed of her treatment of him is the use of being earnest who cares who looks on who gives one moment to the guessing of the meaning that lies beneath to be in earnest in this life is merely to be mad pretend laugh jest do anything but be what you really are and you will probably get through the world in a manner if not satisfactory to yourself at all events to les autres you preach a crusade against yourself says he gently you preach against your own conscience you are the least deceptive person i know were you to follow in the track you lay out for others 
the cruelty of it would kill you to your own self be true and yes yes i know it all says she interrupting him with some irritation i wish you knew how how unpleasant you can be as i tell you you are always right that last dance it is true i didn't want to have anything to do with it but for all that i didn't wish to be told so i merely suggested it as a means of getting rid of miss maliphant says dysart who is feeling a little sore the disingenuousness of this remark is patent to her no mr beauclerk corrects she coldly forgive me says dysart quickly i shouldn't have said that well drawing a long breath we have got rid of them and may i give you a word of advice it is disinterested because it is to my own disadvantage go to your room to your bed you are tired exhausted why wait to be more so say you will do as i suggest you want to get rid of me says she with a little weary smile that is unworthy of an answer gravely but if a yes to it will help you follow my advice why i will say come rising let me take you to the hall you shall have your way says she rising too and following him a side door leading to the ante-room on their left and thus skirting the ballroom without entering it brings them to the foot of the central staircase good night says dysart in a low tone retaining her hand for a moment all round them is a crowd separated into twos and threes so that it is impossible to say more than the mere commonplace good night returns she in a soft tone she has turned away from him but something in the intense longing and melancholy of his eyes compels her to look back again oh you have been kind i am not ungrateful says she with sharp contrition joyce joyce let me be the grateful one returns he his voice is a mere whisper but so fraught is it with passionate appeal that it rings in her brain for long hours afterward her eyes fall beneath his she moves silently away what can she say to him it is with a sense of almost violent relief that she closes the door of her own room behind her and knows herself to be at last alone end of chapter 16 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 17 of april's lady by margaret w hungerford this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by ruhi huck april's lady by martha w hungerford chapter seventeen and vain desires and hopes dismayed and fears that cast the earth in shade my heart did fret night is waning dear pair father of day is making rapid strides across the heavens creating havoc as he goes diana faints the stars grow pale flinging as they die a last soft glimmer across the sky now and again a first call from the birds startles the drowsy air the wood doves coo melancholy sweet the cheep cheep of the robin the hoarse cry of the sturdy crow a faint dawn breaks on yonder sedge and broadens in that bed of weeds a bright disk shows its radiant edge all things bespeak the coming morn yet still it lingers as lady swansdon at baltimore descend the stone steps that lead to the gardens beneath 
only the swift rush of the tremulous breeze that stirs the branches betrays to them the fact that a new life is at hand you are cold says baltimore noticing the quick shiver that runs through her no not cold it was mere nervousness i shouldn't have thought you nervous or fanciful adds she you judged me rightly and yet coming all at once from the garish lights within into this cool darkness here makes one feel in spite of one's self in spite would you never willingly feel would you demands she very slowly not willingly i confess but i have been made to feel as you know and you would you have a woman confess says she half playfully that is taking an unfair advantage is it not see pointing to a seat what a charming resting place i will make one confession to you i am tired a meagre one beatrice he says suddenly tell me this are all women alike do none really feel is it all fancy the mere idle emotion of a moment the evanescent desire for sensation of one sort or another of anger love grief pain that stirs you now and then are none of these things lasting with you are they the mere strings on which you play from time to time because the hours lie heavy on your hands it seems to me it seems to me that you hardly know what you are saying says lady swansdon quickly do you think then that women do not feel do not suffer as men never do what wild thoughts torment your brain that you should put forward so senseless a question one that has been answered satisfactorily thousands of years ago all the pain the suffering of earth lies on the woman's shoulders it has been so from the beginning it shall be so to the end on being thrust forth from their eden which suffered most do you suppose adam or eve it is an old story says he gloomily and why should you of all people back it up you who better leave me out of the question you i am outside your life baltimore says she laying her hand on the back of the seat beside her and sinking into it leave me there would you believe me of all things says he even my friends i thought i believed that you at least understood me too well says she in a low tone her hands have met each other and are now clasped together in her lap in a grip that is almost hurtful great heavens if he only knew could he then probe and wound and tempt if you do begins he then stops short and passing her paces to and fro before her in the dying light of the moon lady swansdon leans back gazes at him with eyes too sad for tears yes wild with all regret oh if they too might but have met earlier if this man this man in all the world had been given to her as her allotment beatrice says he stopping short before her were you ever in love there is a dead silence lady swanston sinking still deeper into the arm of the chair looks up at him with strange curious eyes what does he mean to her to put such a question to her of all women is he deaf blind mad or only cruel a sort of recklessness seizes upon her well if he doesn't know he shall know though it be to the loss of her self-respect for ever never says she leaning a little forward until the moonbeams gleam upon her snowy neck and arms never never until the pause is premeditated it is eloquence itself the light of heaven playing on her beautiful face betrays the passion of it the rich pallor one hand resting on the back of the seat taps upon the iron work the other is now in baltimore's possession until now suggests he boldly he is leaning over her she shakes her head but in this negative there is only affirmation his hand tightens more closely upon her the long slender fingers yield to his pressure nay more return it they twine round his if i thought begins he in a low stammering tone he moves nearer to her nearer still does she move toward him there is a second's hesitation on his part and then his lips meet hers it is but a momentary touch a thing of an instant but it includes a whole world of meaning lady swanston has sprung to her feet and is looking at him with eyes that seem to burn through the mystic darkness she is trembling in every limb her nostrils are dilated her haughty mouth is quivering and there are there honest real tears in those mocking eyes baltimore too has risen his face is very white full of contrition that he regrets his action towards her is unmistakable 
but that there is a deeper contrition behind a sense of self-loathing not to be appeased betrays itself in the anguish of his eyes she had accused him of falsity most falsely up to this but now now his mind has wandered far away there is something so wild in his expression that lady swanston loses sight of herself in the contemplation of it what is it baltimore asks she in a low frightened tone it rouses him i have offended you beyond pardon begins he but more like one seeking for words to say than one afraid of using them i have angered you do not mistake me interrupts she quickly almost fiercely i am not angry i feel no anger nothing but that i am a traitor and what am i work out your own condemnation for yourself says she still with that feverish self-disdain upon her don't ask me to help you she was my friend whatever she is now she trusted me believed in me and after all and you turning passionately you are doubtly a traitor you are a husband in name doggedly he has quite recovered himself now whatever torture his secret soul may impress upon him in the future no one but he shall know it doesn't matter you belong to her and she to you that is what she doesn't think bitterly there is one more thing to be said baltimore says she after a slight pause this must never occur again i like you you know that i she breaks off abruptly and suddenly gives way to a sort of mirthless laughter it is a farce she says consider my feeling anything and so virtuous a thing too as remorse well as one lives one learns if i had seen the light for the first time in the middle of the dark ages i should probably have ended my days as the prioress of a convent as it is i shouldn't wonder if i went in for hospital nursing presently sure angrily it is useless lamenting let me face the truth i have acted abominably toward her so far and the worst of it is with a candour that seems to scorch her i know if the chance be given me i shall behave abominably toward her again i shall leave to-morrow the day after one must invent a decent excuse pray don't leave on lady baltimore's account says he slowly she would be the last to care about this i'm nothing to her is your wish father to that thought regarding him keenly no i assure you the failing i mention is plain to all the world i should have thought it is not plain to me still watching him then learn it says he if ever she loved me which i now disbelieve i would that i had let the doubt creep in earlier it was in a past that now is irretrievably dead i suppose i wearied her i confess with a meagre smile i once loved her with all my heart and soul and strength or else she is incapable of knowing an honest affection that is not true says lady swanston some generous impulse forcing the words unbelievingly through her white lips she can love you must see that for yourself the child is proof of it some women are like that says he gloomily they can open wide their hearts to their children yet close it against the fathers of them isabel's whole life is given up to her child she regards it as hers entirely she allows me no share in him not eagerly that i grudge him one inch the affection she gives him he has a father worthless enough let his mother make it up to him yet he loves the father best says lady swanston quickly i hope not with a suspicion of violence he does believe me one can see it that saintly mother of his has not half the attraction for him that you have why look you it is the way of the world why dispute it well well her triumphant voice deepening to a weary whisper when one thinks of it all she is not too happy she draws her hand in a little bewildered way across her white brow you don't understand her says baltimore frigidly she lives in a world of her own no one would dare penetrate it even i her husband as you call me in mockery am outside it i don't believe she ever cared for me if she had do you think she would have given a thought to that infamous story about madame stray yes you too heard it then who hasn't heard violet walden was not the one to spare you she pauses and looks at him with all her heart in her eyes there was no truth in that story asks she at last her words coming with a little rush none i swear it you believe me he has come nearer to her and taken her hand in the extremity of this desire to be believed in by somebody i believe you says she gently her voice is so low that he can catch the words only the grief and misery in them is unknown to him mercifully too the moon has gone behind a cloud a tender preparation for an abdication presently 
so that he cannot see the two heart-broken tears that steal slowly down her cheeks that is more than isabel does says he with a laugh that has something of despair in it you tell me then says lady swanston that you never saw ma'am astray after your marriage never willingly oh willingly don't misjudge me hear the whole story then if you must cries he passionately though if you do you will be the first to hear it i am tired of being thought a liar go on says she in a low shocked tone her singular vehemence has compelled her to understand how severe have been his sufferings if ever she had doubted the truth of the old story that has wrecked the happiness of his married life she doubts no longer i tell you you will be the first to hear it says he advancing towards her sit down there pressing her into the garden seat i can see you are looking overdone even by this light well drawing a long breath and stepping back from her i never opened my lips upon this subject except once before and to isabel and she he pauses she would not listen she believed then all things base of me she has so believed ever since she must be a fool says lady swanston impetuously she could not she did however she coldly ever believed that i could lie to her his face had become ashen his eyes fixed upon the ground seemed to grow there with the intensity of his regard his breath seems to come with difficulty through his lips well says he at last with a long sigh it's all over the one merciful thing belonging to our life is that there must come sooner or later an end to everything the worst grief has its termination she has been unjust to me but you he lifts his haggard face you perhaps will grant me a kindlier hearing tell it all to me if it will make you happier says she very gently her heart is bleeding for him oh if she might only comfort him in some way if if that other fails him why should not she with the passion of love that lies in her bosom restore him to the warmth the sweetness of life that kiss half developed as it only was already begins to bear the fatal fruit unconsciously she permits herself a license in her thoughts of baltimore hitherto strenuously suppressed there is absolutely little to tell at that time we lived most entirely at our place in hampshire and as there were business matters connected with the outlying farms found there that had been grossly neglected during my grandfather's time i was compelled to run up to town almost daily as a rule i returned by the evening train in time for dinner but once or twice i was so far delayed that it was out of my power to do it i laugh at myself now he looks very far from laughter as he says it but i assure you the occasions on which i was compulsorily kept away from my home were he pauses oh well there is no use in being more tragic than one need be they were at least a trouble to me naturally says she coldly i loved her you see says baltimore in a strange jerky sort of way as if ashamed of that old sentiment she i quite understand i have heard all about it once or twice says lady swanston with a kind of slow haste if such a contradiction may be allowed that he has forgotten her is evident that she has forgotten nothing is more evident still well one day one of the many days during which i went up to town after a long afternoon with goodman and smale in the course of which they had told me they would probably require me to call at their office to meet one of the most influential tenants at nine the next morning i met on leaving their office marchman marchment of the tenth you know yes i know he and a couple of other fellows belonging to his regiment were going down to richmond to dine would i come it was dull in town toward the close of the season and i was glad of any invitation that promised a change of programme anything that would take me away from a dull evening at my club i made no inquiries i accepted the invitation got down in time for dinner and found ma'am the stray was one of the guests i he hesitates go on you are a woman of the world beatrice you will let me confess to you that there have been old passages between me and ma'am stray well i swear to you i had never so much as thought of her since my marriage nay since my engagement to isabel from that hour my life had been clear as a sheet of blank paper i had forgotten her i verily believe she had forgotten me too at that dinner i don't think she exchanged a dozen words with me on my soul pushing back his hair with a slow troubled gesture from his brow this is the truth and yet and yet 
interrupting her with now a touch of vehement excitement a garbled a most cursedly false account of that dinner was given her it came round to her ears she listened to it believed in it condemned without a hearing she who has sworn not only at the altar but to me alone that she loved me she wronged you terribly says lady swanston in a low tone thank you cried he a passion of gratitude in his tone to be believed in by some one so thoroughly as you believed in me is to know happiness indeed whatever happens i can count on you as my friend your friend always says she in a very low voice a voice somewhat broken come she says rising suddenly and walking toward the distant lights of the house he accompanies her silently very suddenly she turns to him and lays her hand upon his arm be my friend says she with a quick access of terrible emotion entreaty and despair mingle in her tone for ever returns he fervently tightening his grasp on her hand well sighing it hardly matters we shall not meet again for a long long time how is that isabel the last time she condescended to speak to me of her own accord with an unpleasant laugh told me that she had asked you to come here again next february and that you had accepted the invitation she indeed made quite a point of it ah that was a long time ago weeks do not make a long time some weeks hold more than years yes you are right she made quite a point about my coming well she's always very civil she has always perfect manners she is as you say very civil she's proud coldly you will come i think not by that time you will in all probability have made it up with her the very essence of improbability while i shall not have made it up with my husband one seems quite as possible as the other no no isabel is a good woman you would do well to go back to her swanston is as bad a man as i know and that with a mirthless laugh is saying a great deal i should gain nothing by a reconciliation with him for one thing an important matter i have a great deal more money than he has and for another there are no children her voice changes here an indescribable alteration not only hardens but desolates it i have been fortunate there she says if in nothing else in my unsatisfactory life there is no smallest bond between me and swanston if i could be seriously glad of anything it would be that of that i have nothing belonging to him his name oh as for that does it belong to him has he not forfeited a decent right to it a thousand times no there is nothing if there had been a child he would have made a persecution of it and i am so better off as it is and yet there are moments when i envy you that little child of yours however yet if swanston were to make an overture do not go on it is of all speculations the most useless do not pursue the subject of swanston i entreat you let with bitter meaning sleeping dogs lie baltimore laughs shortly that is severe says he it is how i feel towards him the light in which i regard him if turning a face to his that is hardly recognizable so pale it is with ill-suppressed loathing he were lying on his deathbed and sent for me it would give me pleasure to refuse to go to him she takes her hand from his arm and motions him to ascend the steps leading into the conservatory but you says he surprised let me remain here a little while i am tired my head aches i let me stay with you no smiling faintly what i want is to be alone to feel the silence go do not be uneasy about me believe me you will be kind if you do as i ask you it is a command says he slowly and slowly too he turns away from her seeing him so uncertain about leaving her she steps abruptly into a dark side path and finding a chair sinks into it the soft breaking of the dawn over the tree-tops far away seems to add another pang to the anguish that is consuming her she covers her face with her hands oh if it had all been different two lives sacrificed say three for surety isabel cannot care for him oh if it had been she she herself what is there she could not have forgiven him nay she must have forgiven him because life without him would have been insupportable if only she might have loved him honourably if only she might ever love him successfully dishonourably the thought seems to sting her involuntarily she throws up her head and courts the chill winds of dawn that sweep with a cool touch her burning forehead 
she had called her proud would she herself then be less proud that isabel dreads her half scorns her of late it is well known to her and yet it is with a very passion of pride would dare her to prove it she isabel had gone even so far as to ask her rival to visit her again in the early part of the coming year to meet her present friends so far that pride had carried her but pride was pride love if she herself loved baltimore would she even for pride's sake entreat the woman he singled out for his attentions to spend another long visit in her country house and if isabel does not honestly love him why then is he not lawful prey for one who can who does not love him one who loves him but he whom does he love torn by some last terrible thought she starts to her feet and as though in action has become impossible to her draws her white silken wrap around her and sweeps rapidly out of all view of the waning chinese lamps into the grey obscurity of the coming day that lies in the far gardens End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of april's lady this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 18 Song have thy day, and take thy fill of light before the night be fallen across thy way sing while he may man hath no long delight what a delicious day says joyce stopping short on the hill to take a look round her it is the next day and indeed far into it luncheon is a thing of the past and both she and dysart know that it will take them all their time to reach st bridget's hill and be back again for afternoon tea they had started on their expedition in defiance of many bribes held out to them for one thing there was to be a reception at the court at five many of those who had danced through last night having been asked to come over late in the afternoon of to-day to talk over the dance itself and the little etceteras belonging to it the young members of the monkton family had been specially invited too a sort of make-up to bertie the little son of the house who had been somewhat aggrieved at being sent to bed without his share of the festivities on hand he had retired to his little cot indeed with his arms stuffed full of crackers but how could crackers and cakes and sweets console any one for the loss of being out at an ungodly hour and seeing a real live dance the one thing that finally helped him to endure his hard lot was a promise on his mother's part that tommy and mabel monkton should come down next day and revel with him among the glorious ruins of the supper table the little monktons had not come however when joyce left for her walk going out lady swansdown said to her meeting her in the hall fully equipped for her excursion but why my dear girl we expect those amusing burks in an hour or so and the delaneys and yes why go repeats beauclerk who has just come up his manner is friendly in the extreme yet a very careful observer might notice a strain about it a determination to be friendly that rather spoils the effect her manner toward him last night after his interview with miss maliphant in the garden and her growing coldness ever since has somewhat disconcerted him mentally could she have heard or seen or been told of anything there might of course have been a little contempts of some sort 
people as a rule are so beastly treacherous you will make us wretched if you desert us says he with impressement as he speaks he goes up to her and lets his eyes as well as his lips implore her miss maliphant had left by the early train so that he is quite unattached and able to employ his whole battery of fascinations on the subjugation of this refractory person i am sorry don't be more wretched than you can help says joyce with a smile wonderfully unconcerned after a dance i want to walk to clear my brain and mr dysart has been good enough to say he will accompany me is he accompanying you says beauclerk with an unpardonable supercilious glance around him as if in search of the absent dysart you mustn't think him a laggard at his post says miss kavanagh still smiling but now in a little provoking way that seems to just at his pretended suspicion of dysart's constancy and dissolve it into the thinnest of thin air he was here just now but i sent him to lose the dogs i like to have them with me and lady baltimore is pleased when they get a run isabel is always so sympathetic says he with a quite new and delightful rush of sympathy towards isabel i suppose glancing at joyce keenly you would not care for an additional escort the dogs and dysart will be sufficient mr dysart and the dogs will be says she ah here he comes as dysart appears at the open doorway a little pack of terriers at his heels what a time you've been cries she moving quickly to him i thought you would never come good-bye lady swanston good-bye glancing casually at beauclerk keep one teapot for us if you can she trips lightly up the avenue at dysart's side leaving beauclerk in a rather curious frame of mind yes she has heard something that is his first thought how to counteract the probable influence of that something is the second a little dwelling upon causes and effects shows him the way for an effect there is often an antidote delicious indeed says dysart in answer to her remark his answer is however a little distrait his determination of last night to bring her here and compel her to listen to the honest promptings of his heart is still strong within him they have now ascended the hill and standing on its summit can look down on the wild deep sea beneath them that lies to all possible seeming as calm and passive as their feet as might a thing inanimate yet within its depths what terrible what mournful tragedies lie and as if in contrast what ecstatic joys to one it speaks like death itself to another the bridegroom see is toying with the shore his wedded bride and in the fullness of his marriage joy he decorates her tawny brow with shells retires apace to see how far she looks then proud runs up to kiss her shall we sit here says dysart indicating a soft mound of grass that overlooks the bay you must be tired after last night's dancing i am tired says she sinking upon the soft cushion that nature has provided with a little sigh of satisfaction perhaps i should not have asked have extracted a promise from you to come here says dysart with contrition in his tone i should have remembered you would be overdone and that a long walk like this would be the very thing to restore me to a proper state of health she interrupts him with the prettiest smile no 
don't pretend you are sorry you brought me here you know it is the sheerest hypocrisy on your part you are glad that you brought me here i hope and i deliberately am glad that you did do you mean that says dysart gravely he had not seated himself beside her and is now looking down her from a goodly height do you know why i brought you to bring me back again as fresh as a daisy suggests she with a laugh that is spoiled in its birth by a glance from him no i did not think of you at all i thought only of myself says dysart speaking a little quickly now call that selfish if you will and yet he stops short and comes closer to her to think in that way was to think of you too joyce there is at all events one thing you do know that i love you miss kavanagh nods her head silently there is one thing too that i know says dysart now with a little tremble in his voice that you do not love me she is silent you are honest says he after a pause still looking at her if there wasn't hope one would know though the present is empty for me i cannot help dwelling on the thought that the future may contain something the future is so untranslatable says she with a little evasion tell me this at least says dysart very earnestly bending over her with the air of one determined to sift his chances to the last grain you like me oh yes better than courtney for example with a fleeing smile that fails to disguise the real anxiety he is enduring what an absurd question then dicky brown yes but here she lifts her head and gazes at him in a startled way that speaks of quick suspicion there is something of entreaty too in her dark eyes a desire that he will go no further but dysart deliberately disregards it then beauclerk asks he in a clear almost cruel tone a horrible red rushes up to dye her pretty cheeks in spite of all her efforts to subdue it great tears of shame and confusion suffuse her eyes one little reproachful glance she casts at him and then of course says she almost vehemently as if a little faintly her eyes sinking to the ground dysart stands before her as if stricken in stone then the knowledge that he has hurt her pierces him with a terrible certainty overcomes all other thoughts and drives him to repentance i shouldn't have asked you that says he bluntly no no says she acquiescing quickly and yet raising an eager loving face to his i hardly know anything about about myself sometimes i think i like him sometimes she stops abruptly and looks at him with a pained and frightened gaze do you despise me for betraying myself like this no i want to hear all about it ah that is what i want to hear myself but who is to tell me nature won't sometimes i hate him last night yes i know you hated him last night i don't wish to know why i am quite satisfied in that you did so but shall i hate him to-morrow oh yes i think so i hope so cries she suddenly i am tired of it all he is not a real person not one possible to class he is false naturally treacherous and yet she breaks off again very abruptly and turns to dysart as if for help let us forgive him says she and then in a little frightened way 
oh i wish i could be sure i could forget him why can't you says dysart in his downright way it means only a strong effort after all if you feel honestly with an earnest glance at her like that toward him you must be mad to give him even a corner in your heart that is it says she there the puzzle begins i don't know if he ever has a corner in my heart he attracts me but attraction is not affection and the heart holds only love and hatred indifference is nothing you can get rid of him finally says dysart boldly by giving yourself to me that will kill all all he may be going to say is killed on his lips at this moment by two little wild shrieks of joy that sound right behind his head both he and joyce turn abruptly in its direction he with a sense of angry astonishment she with a fell knowledge of its meaning it is indeed no surprise to her when tommy and mabel appear suddenly from behind the rock just close to them that hides the path in part and precipitates themselves into her arms we saw you we saw you gasped tommy breathlessly from his run up the hill we saw you far away down there on the road and we told bridgie the maid that we'd run up and she said cut along so here we are you are indeed says dysart with feeling we knew you'd be glad to see us goes on tommy to joyce in the beautiful roar he has always adopted when excited you haven't been home for years and bridgie says that because you are going to be married to get up tommy you are too heavy and besides i want to kiss mabel says tommy's aunt with prodigious haste and a hot cheek but mommy says you're a silly billy says mabel in her shrill treble and that mommy is a shocking rude person says mr dysart hurrying to break into the dangerous confidence no matter at what cost even at the expense of the adored mommy his remark is taken very badly she is not says tommy glowering at him father says she's an angel and he knows i heard him say it and angels are never rude twas after he made her cry about something says mabel lifting her little flower-like face to dysart's in a miniature imitation of her brother's indignation she was boo-booing like anything and then father got sorry oh dreadful sorry and he said she was an angel and she said oh mabel says joyce weakly you know you oughtn't say such well twas your fault twas all about you says tommy defiantly why don't you come home father says you ought to come and mommy says she doesn't know which of em it will be and father says it won't be any of them and what's it all about turning a frankly inquisitive little face up to hers they won't tell us and we want to know which of em it will be yes and it gents demands mabel who probably means giants and not cold meats i don't know what she means says miss cavanagh coldly i say you too says mr dysart brilliantly wouldn't you like to run a race bridget must be tired of waiting for you down there at the end of the hill and she isn't waiting she's talking to mickey daly says tommy oh i see well look here i bet you tommy strong as you look mabel can outrun you down the hill she she cries tommy indignantly i could beat her in a minute you can't cries mabel in turn 
nurse says i'm twice the child that you are your legs are as short as a pin roars tommy you couldn't run i can i can i can says mabel on the verge of a violent flood of tears well we'll see says mr dysart who now begins to think he has thrown himself away on a silly hussar regiment when he ought to have taken rank as a distinguished diplomat come i'll start you both down the hill and whichever reaches bridget first wins the day instantly both children spring to the front of the path you're standing before me tommy no i'm not you're cheating you are cheat yourself mr dysart ain't i all right i think you should give her a start she's the girl you know says dysart there now go that's very good five yards tommy is a small allowance for a little thing like mabel steady now you two one good gracious they're off says he turning to miss kavanagh with a sigh of relief mingled with amusement they had no idea of waiting for more than one signal i hope they will meet this bridget and get back to their mother they are not going to her just now they are going on to the court to spend the afternoon with bertie says joyce barbara told me so last night dear things how sweet they looked they are the prettiest children i know says dysart a little absent perhaps he falls into silence for a moment or two and then suddenly looks at her he advances a step End of chapter 18 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 19 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter eighteen a continual battle goes on in a child's mind between what it knows and what it comprehends well says he he advances even nearer and dropping on a stone close to her takes possession of one of her hands as you can't make up your mind to him and as you say you like me say something more more yes a great deal more take the next move say boldly that you will marry me joyce grows a little pale she has certainly been prepared for this speech had been preparing herself for it all the long weary wakeful night yet now that she hears it it seems as strange as terrible as though it had never suggested itself to her in its vaguest form why should i say that says she at last stammering a little and feeling somewhat disingenuous she had known yet now she is trying to pretend that she did not know because i ask you you see i put the poorest reason at first and because you say i am not hateful to you and because well because when a man's last chance of happiness lies in the balance he will throw his very soul into the weighing of it and knowing this you may have pity on me as though pressed down by some unsupportable weight the girl rises and makes a little curious gesture as if to free herself from it her face still pale betrays an inward struggle after all why cannot she give herself to him why can't she love him he loves her love as some poor fool says begets love and he is honest 
yes honest a pang shoots through her breast that when all is told is the principal thing he is not uncertain untrustworthy double-faced as some men are again that cruel pain contracts her heart to be able to believe in a person to be able to trust implicitly in each lightest word to read the real meaning in every sentence to see the truth shining in the clear eyes this is to know peace and happiness and yet you know all says she looking up at him her eyes compressed her brow frowning i am uncertain of myself nothing seems sure to me but if you wish it wish it clasping her hands closer there is this to be said then i will promise to answer you this day twelve month twelve months says he with concertation his grasp on her hands loosens if the prospect frightens or displeases you there is nothing more to be said rejoins she coldly it is she who is calm and composed he is nervous and anxious but a whole year that is nothing says she releasing her hands with a little determined show of strength from his it is for you to decide i don't care perhaps she hardly grasps the cruelty that lies in this half impatient speech until she sees dysart's face flush painfully you need not have said that says he i know it i am nothing to you really he pauses and then says again in a low tone nothing oh you mustn't feel so much cries she as if tortured it is folly to feel at all in this world what's the good of it and to feel about me i am not worth it if you would only bear that in mind it might help you if i bore that in mind i should not want to make you my wife returns he steadily gravely think as you will yourself you do not shake my faith in you well with a deep breath i accept your terms for a year i shall feel myself bound to you though that is a farce for i shall always be bound to you soul and body while you shall hold yourself free and try to no no we must both be equal both free while i she stopped short coloring warmly and laughing what is it i am to try to do to love me replies he with infinite sadness in look and tone yes says joyce slowly and then again meditatively yes she lifts her eyes presently and regards him strangely and if all my trying should not succeed if i never learn to love you why then it is all over this hope of mine is at an end says he so calmly yet with such deep melancholy such sad foreboding that her heart is touched oh it is a hope of mine too says she quickly if it were not would i listen to you to-day but you must not be so downhearted let the worst come to the worst you will be as well off as you are at this instant he shakes his head does hope count for nothing then you would compel me to love you says she growing the more vexed as she grows the more sorry for him would you have me marry you even if i did not love you her soft eyes have filled with tears there is a suspicion of reproach in her voice no i suppose not he half turns away from her at this moment a sense of despair falls on him she will never care for him never never this proposed probation is but a mournful farce 
a sorry clinging to a hope that is built on sand. When in the future she marries, as so surely she will, he will not be her husband. Why not give in at once? Why fight with the impossible? Why not break all links, frail as they are sweet, and let her go her way, and he his, while yet there is time? To falter is to court destruction. Then, all at once, a passionate reaction sets in. Joyce, looking at him, sees the light of battle, the warmth of love, the unconquerable, spring into his eyes. No, he will not cave in. He will resist to the last, dispute every inch of the ground, and if finally only defeat is to crown his efforts still. And why should defeat be his, be it Beauclerk or another? Whoever declares himself his rival shall find him a formidable enemy to overcome. Joyce, says he quickly, turning to her and grasping her hands, give me my chance. Give me those twelve months. Give me your thoughts now, and then, while they last. I brought you here today to say all this knowing we should be alone and without... Tommy? says she with a little laugh oh well you must confess i got rid of him says he smiling too and glad in his heart to find her so cheerful i think if you look into it that my stragum the enticing him to the overcoming of his sister in that race was the work of a diplomatist of the first water i f quite felt that a war whoop behind him dissolves his self-gratulations into nothing. Here comes Tommy the valiant, triumphant, puffed beyond all description, with pride and want of breath. I beat her, I beat her, shrieks he, with the last note left in his tuneful pipe. He staggers the last yard or two and falls into Joyce's arms, that are open wide to receive him who shall say he is not a happy interlude evidently joyce regards him as such i came back to tell you says tommy recovering himself a little i knew with the fearless confidence of childhood that you'd be longing to know if i beat her and i did she's down there how with bridgie pointing to the valley beneath and she's mad with me because I didn't let her win. You ought to go back to her, says Dysart. She'll be madder if you don't. She won't. She's picking daisies now. But Bridget will want you. No, shaking his lovely little head. Bridgie said, Ye may go, sir, and ye needn't be in a hurry back. Me and Mickey Daly have a lot to say about my mother's daughter. It would be impossible to describe the accuracy with which Tommy describes Bridget's tone and manner. Oh, I dare say, says Mr. Dysart, me mother's daughter must be a truly enthralling person. I think Tommy ought to be educated for the stage, says Joyce in a little whisper. He'll certainly make his mark wherever he goes, says Dysart, laughing. Tommy, after a careful examination of Monkton Jr.'s seraphic countenance, don't you think you ought to take your sister on to the court? So I will, says Tommy, in a minute or two. He has climbed into Joyce's lap and is now sitting on her with his arms round her neck to make love to a young woman and to induce her to marry you with a barnacle of this sort hanging round her suggests difficulties mr dysart waits all things come to those who wait says a wily old proverb but dysart proves this proverb a swindle now tommy says he the two minutes are up i don't care 
says Tommy. I'm tired. And Bridgie says I needn't hurry. The charms of Mr. Mickey Daly are no doubt great, says Dysart mildly. Yet I think Bridget must by this time be aware that she wasn't sent out by your mother to tattle to him, but to take you and your sister to play with Bertie. Here, Tommy, decisively, get off your aunt's lap and run away. But why? demands Tommy aggressively. What harm am I doing? You are tiring your aunt for one thing. I am not. She likes to have me here, defiantly. I ride a cock horse every night when she's at home, don't I, Joyce? I wish you'd go away, wrathfully, because then Joyce would come home and play with us again. Tis you, glaring at him with deep-seated anger in his eyes, who are keeping her here. Oh, no, you are wrong there says dysart with a sad smile i could not keep her anywhere she would not stay with me but really tommy you know you ought to go to the court poor little bertie is looking out for you eagerly see plunging his hand into his pocket here is half a crown for you to spend on lollipops i'll give it to you if you'll go back to bridget Tommy's eyes brighten, but as quickly the charming blue in them darkens again. There is no tuck shop between this and the court. "'Tisn't any good,' says he mournfully. "'The shop's away down there,' pointing vaguely backward on the journey he has come. "'You look strong in wind and limb. There is no reason to believe that moral sun may not dawn on you.' says mr dysart and then think tommy think what a joy you will be to old molly brin molly gives me four bull's eyes for a penny says tommy reflectively that's two to mabel and two to me because mommy says baby mustn't have any for fear she'd choke if there's four for a penny how many is there for this holding out the half crown that lies upon his little brown shapely palm that's a sum says mr dysart tommy you're a cruel boy and having struggled with it for a moment he says one hundred and twenty no says tommy in a voice faint with hopeful unbelief joyce tisn't true is it quite true says joyce just fancy tommy one hundred and twenty bull's-eyes all in one day there is such a genuine support of his desire to get rid of tommy in her tone that dysart's heart rises within him tie it into my handkerchief says tommy without another second's hesitation tie it tight or it'll slip out and i'll lose it good-bye and thank you mr dysart thrusting a hot little fist into his i'll keep some of the hundred and twenty ones for you and joyce he rushes away down the hill eager to tell his grand news to mabel and presently joyce and dysart are alone again you see you were not so clever a diplomatist as you thought yourself says joyce smiling faintly tommy came back tommy and i have one desire in common we both want to be with you could you be bought off like tommy says she half playfully oh no half a crown would not be good enough would all the riches the world contains be good enough says he in a voice very low but full of emotion you know it would not but you joyce twelve months is a long time you may see others if not beauclerk others and money would not tempt me says the girl slowly if money were your rival 
you would indeed be safe you ought to know that still joyce he stopped suddenly may i think of you as joyce i have called you so once or twice but you may always call me so says she gently if indifferently all my friends call me so and you are my friends surely the very sweetness of her manner cold as ice as it is drives him to desperation not your friend your lover says he with sudden passion joyce think of all that i have said all you have promised a small matter to you perhaps the whole world to me you will wait for me for twelve months you will try to love me you yes but there is something more to be said cries the girl springing to her feet as if in violent protest and confronting him with a curious look set determined a little frightened perhaps end of chapter nineteen recorded by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter twenty i thought love had been a joyous thing quoth my uncle toby he hath a heart as sound as a bell and his tongue is the clapper for what his heart thinks his tongue speaks more said dysart startled by her expression and puzzled as well yes hurriedly this the very nervousness that is consuming her throws fire into her eyes and speech during all these long twelve months i shall be free quite free you forgot to put that in you must remember that if if i should after all this thinking decide on not having anything to do with you you vehemently will have no right to reproach me remember says she going up to him and laying her hand upon his arm while the blood receding from her face leaves her very white remember should such a thing occur and it is very likely slowly i warn you of that you are not to consider yourself wronged or aggrieved in any way why should you talk to me in this way begins he aggravated now at all events you must recollect feverishly that i have made you no promise not one i refuse even to look upon this matter as a serious thing i tell you honestly her dark eyes gleaming with nervous excitement i don't believe i ever shall so look at it after all pausing you will do well if you now put an end to this farce between us and tell me to take myself and my dull life out of yours for ever i shall never tell you that in a low tone well well impatiently i have warned you it will not be my fault if oh it is foolish of you she blurts out suddenly i have told you i don't understand myself and still you waste yourself you throw yourself away in the end you will be disappointed in me if not in one way then another it hurts me to think of that there is time still let us be friends friends her hands are tightly clasped she looks at him with a world of entreaty in her beautiful eyes friends felix breathes she softly let things rest as they are i beseech you says he taking her hand and holding it in a tight grasp the future who can ever say what that great void will bring us i will trust to it and if only loss and sorrow be my portion still 
as for friendship joyce whatever happens i shall be your friend and lover well you quite know says the girl almost sullenly quite and i accept the risk do not be angry with me my beloved he lifts the hand he holds and presses it to his lips wondering always at the coldness of it you are free joyce you desire it so and i desire it too i would not hamper you in any way i should not be able to endure it if afterward i thought you were reproaching me says she with a little weary smile be happy about that says he i shall never reproach you he is silent for a moment her last speech has filled him with thoughts that presently grow into extremely happy ones unless unless she liked him cared for him in some decided if vague manner would his future misery be of so much importance to her oh surely not a small flood of joy flows over him a radiant smile parts his lips the light of a coming triumph that shall gird and glorify his whole life illuminates his eyes she regarding him grows suddenly uneasy you you fully understand says she drawing back from him oh you have made me do that says he but his radiant smile still lingers then why mistrustfully do you look so happy she draws even further away from him it is plain she resents that happiness is there no reason says he have you not let me speak and having spoken do you not still let me linger near you it is more than i dared hope for therefore poor as is my chance i rejoice now do not forbid me i may have no reason to rejoice in the future let me then have my day it grows very late says miss kavanagh abruptly let us go home silently they turn and descend the hill halfway down he pauses and looks backward whatever comes of it says he i shall always love this spot though if the year's end leave me desolate i hope i shall never see it again it is unlikely to rejoice too soon says she in a low whisper oh don't say that word rejoice how it reminds me of you it ought to belong to you it does you should have been called rejoice instead of joyce they have cut off half of your name to see you is to feel new life within one's veins ah i said you didn't know me returns she sadly meantime the hours have flown evening is descending it is all very well for those who travelling up and down romantic hills can find engrossing matters for conversation in their idle imagings of love or their earnest belief therein but to the ordinary ones of the earth mundane comforts are still of some worth tea the all-powerful is now holding high reverie in the library at the court round the cosy tables growing genial beneath the steam of the many old queen anne pots the guests are sitting singly or in groups what delicious little cakes says lady swansdown taking up a smoking morsel of cooked butter and flour from the glowing tripod beside her you like them says lady baltimore in her slow earnest way so does joyce she thinks they are the nicest cakes in the world by the by where is joyce she went out for a walk at twenty minutes of two says beauclerk he has pulled out his watch and is steadily counting it it is now twenty minutes after five said lady swansdown maliciously who detests beauclerk and who has read his relations with joyce as clear as a book how she must have enjoyed herself yes but where said lady baltimore anxiously joyce has been left in her charge and apart from that she likes the girl well enough 
to be uneasy about her when occasion arises with whom would be a more appropriate question says dicky brown who as usual is just where he ought not to be oh i know where she is cries a little shrill voice from the background it comes from tommy and from that part of the room where tommy and mabel and little bertie are having a game behind the window curtains blocks dolls kitchens farmyards ninepins all have been given to them as a means of keeping them quiet one thing only has been forgotten the fact that the human voice divine is more attractive to them more replete with delightful mystery fuller of enthralling possibilities than all the toys that ever yet were made thomas are you fully alive to the responsibilities to which you pledge yourself demands mr brown severely what says tommy do you pledge yourself to declare where miss kavanagh is now is it joyce says tommy coming forward and standing undaunted in his knickerbockers and an immaculate collar that defies suspicion yes joyce says mr brown who never can hold his tongue well i know tommy pauses and an unearthly silence falls on the assembled company half the county is present and as tommy in the character of reconteur is widely known and deservedly dreaded expectation spreads itself among its audience lady baltimore moves uneasily and for once dicky brown feels as, as if he should like to sink in his boot she's up on the top of the hill with mr dysart says tommy and no more lady baltimore sighs with relief and mr brown feels now as if he should like to give tommy something how do you know says beauclerk as though he finds it impossible to repress the question because i saw her there says tommy when mabel and me was coming here i like mr dysart don't you addressing beauclerk specifically he is a very kind sort of man he gave me half a crown for what tommy asked baltimore idly to whom tommy is an unfailing joy to go away and leave him alone with joyce says tommy with awful distinctness tabot lady baltimore lets her spoon fall into her saucer making a little quick clatter everybody tries to think of something to say nobody succeeds mr brown who is evidently choking is mercifully delivered by beneficent nature from a sudden death he gives way to a loud and sonorous sneeze oh dicky how funny do you sneeze says lady swanston it is a safety valve everybody at once affects to agree with her and universal laughter makes the room ring tommy i think it is time for you and mabel to go home says lady baltimore i promised your mother to send you back early give her my love and tell her i am so sorry she couldn't come to me to-day but i suppose last night's fatigue was too much for her twasn't that said tommy twas because cook yes yes of course i know says lady baltimore hurriedly afraid of further revelations now say good-bye and bertie you can go as far as the first gate with them the children make their adieus tommy reserving dicky brown for the last fond embrace good-bye old man so long what's that says tommy appealing to beauclerk for information what's what said beauclerk who isn't in his usual amiable mood what's the meaning of that thing dicky said to me so long oh that's brown's charming way of saying good-bye oh says tommy thoughtfully he runs it through his busy brain and brings it out at the other end satisfactorily translated i know says he go long that's what he meant but i think indignantly he needn't be rude anyway the children have hardly gone when joyce and dysart enter the room i hope i'm not dreadfully late cries joyce 
carelessly taking off her cap and giving her head a little light shake as if to make her pretty soft hair fall into its usual charming order i have no idea what the time is broken your watch dysart said beauclerk in a rather nasty tone come and sit here dearest and have your tea says lady baltimore making room on the lounge beside her for joyce who has grown a little red it is so warm in here says she nervously that one remark of beauclerk's having somehow disconcerted her if if i might no no you mustn't go upstairs for a little while says lady baltimore with kindly decision but you may go into the conservatory if you like pointing to an open door off the library that leads into a bower of sweets it is cooler there far cooler said beauclerk who has followed joyce with a sort of determination in his genial air let me take you there miss cavanagh it is impossible to refuse joyce coldly almost disdainfully and with her head held higher than usual skirts the groups that line the walls on the western side of the room and disappears with him into the conservatory End of chapter twenty recording by Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver BC Chapter twenty one of April's Lady This is a Librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter 21. Who dares to think one thing and another tell? My heart detests him as the gates of hell a little foolish going for that walk wasn't it says he leading her to a low cushioned chair over which a gay magnolia bends its white blossoms his manner is innocence itself ignorance itself would perhaps better express it he has decided on ignoring everything though a shrewd guess that she saw something of his passages with miss maliphant last night has now become almost a certainty i thought you seemed rather played out last night fatigued done to death i assure you i noticed it i could hardly with deep and affectionate concern fail to notice anything that affected you you are very good said miss kavanagh icily mr beauclerk lets a full minute go by and then what have i done to merit that tone from you asked he not angrily only sorrowfully he has turned his handsome face full on hers and is regarding her with proud reproachful eyes it is idle to deny says he with some emotion half of which to do him justice is real that you are changed to me something has happened to alter the feelings of of friendship that i dared to hope you entertained for me i have hoped still more joyce but what has happened demands he suddenly with all the righteousness strength of one who free from guilt resents accusation of it have i accused you says she coldly yes a thousand times yes do you think your voice alone can condemn your eyes are even crueler judges well i am sorry says she faintly smiling my eyes must be deceivers then i bear you no malice believe me so be it says he with an assumption of relief that is very well done after all i have worried myself i dare say very unnecessarily let us talk of something else miss maliphant for example with a glance at her and a pleasant smile nice girl eh i miss her she went 
early this morning, did she? says Joyce, scarcely knowing what to say. Her lips feel a little dry, an agonized certainty that she is showing growing crimson beneath his steady gaze brings the tears to her eyes too early i quite hoped to be up to see her off but sleep had made its own of me and i failed to wake such a good genuine girl universal favorite don't you think very honest and very breaking into an apparently irrepressible laugh ugly ah well now with smiling self-condemnation that's really a little too bad isn't it a great deal too bad says joyce gravely i shouldn't speak of her if i were you but why my dear girl with arched brows and a little gesture of his handsome hands i allow her everything but beauty and surely it would be hypocrisy to mention that in the same breath with her it isn't fair it isn't sincere says the girl almost passionately do you think i am ignorant of everything that i did not see you with her last night in the garden oh with a touch of scorn that is yet full of pain you should not you should not indeed in an instant he grows confused something in the lovely horror of her eyes undoes him only for an instant after that he turns the momentary confusion to good account ah you did see her then poor girl says he well i am sorry about that for her sake why for her sake still regarding him with that charming disdain for your own perhaps but why for hers beauclerk pauses then rising suddenly stands before her grief and gentle indignation sit upon his massive brow he looks the very incarnation of injured rectitude do you know joyce you have always been ready to condemn to misjudge me says he in a low hurt tone i have often noticed it yet have failed to understand why it is i was right you see when i told myself last night and this morning that you were harboring unkindly thoughts towards me you have not been open with me you have been wilfully secretive and believe me that is a mistake candor complete and perfect is the only great virtue that will steer one clear through all the shoals and rocks of life be honest above board and i can assure you you will never regret it you accuse me just now of insincerity have you been sincere there was a dead pause he allows it to last long enough to make it dramatic and to convince himself he has impressed her and then with a very perceptible increase of dignified pain in his voice he goes on i feel i ought not to explain under the circumstances but as it is to you heavy emphasis on uh, second affected silence you have heard perhaps of miss maliphant's cousin in india no says joyce after racking her brain in vain for some memory of the cousin question and indeed it would have been noting short of a miracle if she could have remembered anything about that apocryphal person you will understand that i speak to you in the strictest confidence says beauclerk earnestly i wouldn't for anything you could offer me that is that it should get back to the poor girl's ear that i had been discussing her and the most sacred feelings of her heart well there is a cousin and she you may have noticed that she and i were great friends yes says joyce whose heart is beating now to suffocation oh has she wronged him does she still wrong him is this vile suspicious feeling within her to be encouraged is all this story of his this simple explanation false false 
I was, indeed, a sort of confidant of hers. Poor dear girl, it was a relief to her to talk to somebody. There were others, but none here who knew him. You knew him, then? His name is Maliphant, too? asked Joyce, ashamed of her cross-examination, yet driven to it by some power beyond her control. You mustn't ask me that, said Beauclerk, playfully. There are some things I must keep even from you. Though you see I go very far to satisfy your unjust suspicions of me. You can, however, guess a good deal. You saw her crying? She was not crying, says Joyce slowly, a little puzzled. Miss Maliphant had seemed at the moment in question well pleased. No, not when you saw her? Ah, that must have been later then with a sigh now you see i am betraying more than i should however i can depend upon your silence it will be a small secret between you and me and miss maliphant says joyce coldly as for me what is the secret you haven't understood not really well between you and me and the wall with delightful gaiety i think she gives a thought or two to that cousin i fancy whispering she is even in ah uh, you know i don't says joyce slowly who is now longing to believe in him and yet is held steadily backward by some strong feeling i believe she is in love with him says beauclerk still in a mysterious whisper but it is a sore subject with an expressive frown not best pleased when it is mentioned to her mauvais sujet you understand but girls are often foolish in that way better say nothing about it i shall say nothing of course says joyce why should i it is nothing to me though i am sorry for her yet as she says this a doubt arises in her mind as to whether she need be sorry is there a cousin in india could that big jolly lively girl who had come into the conservatory with beauclerk last night with the light of triumph in her eyes be the victim of an unhappy love affair should she write and ask her if there is a cousin in india oh no no she could not do that how horrible how hateful to distrust him like this what a detestable mind must be hers and besides why dwell so much upon it why not accept him as a pleasing acquaintance one with whom to pass a pleasant hour now and then why ever again regard him as a possible lover a little shudder runs through her at this moment it seems to her that she could never really have so regarded him and yet only last night and now what is it does she still doubt will that strange curious tormenting feeling that once she felt for him return no more is it gone for ever oh that it might be so End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.